Two years ago in 10th grade, in English class, uh, for the entire school year, every time that we had a class on Tuesday, uh, we would take that time, the entire class time, to learn about any topic we wanted. We could learn any skill, anything in the world. Some of my classmates, they took the time to learn how to curl a free kick from 20 yards out, or how to cook a vegan meal. I could have chosen any topic to study, any skill, and I chose to study driverless cars. Now, sometimes I regret that decision. Sometimes I wish that I had learned how to throw an effective curveball or how to sink a putt from 15 feet away, but no, I, I learned how to study driverless cars, and I stand by that decision. Uh, firstly, I'm, I'm here today. I, I get to talk to you about driverless cars, and, and, and driverless cars, if implemented correctly, they're an innovation that could fundamentally change the way we live our daily lives. It really is the opportunity to watch the future unfold before our eyes. So here in Doha, traffic is pretty terrible. You could be sitting at an intersection, eighth in line, and the light turns green. One car after another accelerates, but you're still sitting there waiting for the car in front of you to move. And so the cars slowly accelerate, slowly move out like an accordion, and by the time you get to the intersection, the light is already flashing, and it turns yellow and you have to stop. The only reason this happens is because of human error. Human reaction times limit our ability to all accelerate at the same time and efficiently make it through the intersection. Now, I want to make this clear. Humans are terrible at driving. Uh, last year in the US alone, 33,000 people died in car crashes. And according to the NHTSA, 94% of those were due to human error. Uh, humans, we take wrong turns, take inefficient routes, uh, we get distracted easily, we have short attention spans, we, we are very bad at driving. Now, along with devastating environmental impacts, traffic snarls and car crashes, they're all problems that are caused in large part to human error. So how do we solve the problem that is the car? Well, today in 2018, it's actually pretty simple. Remove the human from the steering wheel. And that is possible through the use of driverless cars. Today, I want to tell you a little bit about why I think driverless cars will go on to be the innovation with the greatest impact on the 21st century. So what is a driverless car? Obviously, it's, the car with, it's, it's, a, it's a car without the need uh, for a human behind the steering wheel. Uh, but today I'm going to tell you a little bit about how they work and also some interesting ethical conundrums that come up with their implementation and adoption. So in the driverless car world, there are five levels to how autonomous a vehicle really is, but really six, because we start at level zero. Level zero is a car with no computer in it, no autonomous features whatsoever. And those cars, you really cannot find them on the road because at level one, you, you see some really rudimentary features like cruise control or anti-locking brakes, just some fundamental features you can find in any car. Uh, level two, jump from level one to level two, it's pretty small. Level two, we see these cars in the past about 10 years. Uh, these features in level two include anti-locking brakes, uh, or, uh, lane, lane keeping, or auto braking, just little helping hands from computers to keep you and others safe. Now, the jump from level one to level two, that's been done in the past decade, and that's pretty simple. But jumping from level two to three, that's much more significant, because in level three, four, and five, you can only find a couple of companies that have been able to do that. Uh, Uber, Google, Tesla, that's about it. In this upper echelon of, autonomous, uh, of autonomy, you really can't find too many cars on the road, and that's for a few reasons. We see hardware and software. But why is getting a computer to drive a car so difficult? We've had computers flying planes on autopilot since the 1940s. Computers have been sh uh, shipping boats, have been propelling boats since the 1920s. Trains, trains are pretty simple. We've been doing that since the 18th century, 19th century. You, they're on a track, you just have to control the speed, right? So 2018, why can't we get cars? Why can't we get computers to drive cars? Well, we're going to start with hardware. And with hardware, you can't use GPS. You can't 
use some really fundamental uh, basic features because GPS, you see these satellites in low Earth orbit, and when you go to use Google Maps, for example, on your phone, the dot isn't always exactly where you are. It may lag a little bit behind, it may be off a meter or two, one direction or another. And I don't know about you, but I definitely don't want to be in a car that's off by a meter or two in one direction or another. And, and it has this latency, right, with GPS. And, and I don't want to be in a car that's reacting slower than I can react to my surroundings. If a computer is controlling my car, I want it to be better than me. So we can't use GPS. We also can't use any existing maps because if you've seen in Doha, roads change very frequently. So all the computations, all the measurements need to be done on board and in the moment. So that's where we come to hardware. And hardware on the cars, on these driverless cars, you see an array of computer vision technologies. Infrared sensors, cameras, radar, and LIDAR. LIDAR is just like radar. Radar uses radio wave pulses. LIDAR is a bit newer. It uses light pulses to uh, create a 3D projection, a 3D map around the car. And when implemented correctly, when these hardware technologies are implemented correctly, they can create perfect drivers. Now think about it. Humans, humans, we are, as I've said, we are very bad at driving. But computers, computers, they won't get tired. They don't stop paying attention to the road. They don't, they don't drive drunk. They don't get hungry. They won't be tired behind the wheel. Computers, they are perfect drivers. And with the right sensors and technology, with the right software, we can see perfect cars on the road. But it's one thing to take in all this data, to attach all these sensors to the cars. It's another thing to implement, to interpret all the ones and zeros coming in. And that's where we get to software. Because, as I said, it, it's very difficult to, to take in all this data and actually put it into uh, steering column uh, changes and, and control the brakes and, and, the, and the gas pedal. That's something that we're very good at. But computers, they don't know what's going on. They just know that they're collecting all this data from dis different sensors. And so it's actually the humans that need to program in all these decision-making features. And that's actually where we get to an ethical dilemma. We, we probably know the infamous trolley problem. And so with humans, we, we have decision-making that's innate. Even the youngest children, they know to, to, to decide between a good and a bad, but computers, they don't know that. It's just all, as I said, binary, one and zero, uh, on and off. And so in the trolley problem, let's say that we have a driverless car going down the road at highway speeds, and there is an unavoidable collision. What will be pro we programmed in to the car? Should it veer off and, say, hit, hit an animal to its right, or let's say, that there's another car with a family in it to its left. These cars, they make thousands of calculations every second, much faster than any human. Humans, even the most elite athletes, uh, even the best of the best, the fastest reaction times, 200 milliseconds. And when you're going at highway speeds, that fraction of a second, that's the difference between life and death. But computers, they make thousands of calculations a second. So when you put them in this situation, they'll have time to react, which means that they have time to decide. Should they take the life of an animal or humans, an old person, young people? Who's, who's to say? And that's all going to come down to the developers that actually write the code. Now, for commuters, for people like me, for people on the roads, sitting in traffic all the time, driverless cars are fantastic. Um, people like me who are too young to drive, now we have driverless cars. People who are old and losing the ability to drive, driverless cars. Um, insurance companies, they will love driverless cars because you have a perfect driver that you can collect premiums on. But for driving professionals, it's a bit different. Imagine that you're a taxi driver, truck driver, delivery man, who's paid to steer a truck, to drive a, a motorcycle. When the driverless revolution comes around, all their jobs will be phased out. In the US alone, 
there are four million people employed just steering a wheel, driving a truck. Now back in the early 1900s, when we switched from horses to cars, there wasn't much of a protest from the horses. But if we have four million people in the US and millions more around the world out of a job, who's to say what, what type of upheaval we'll see? Two years ago in 10th grade, I, I chose to study driverless cars because I am fascinated with technology, transportation, and the future. I hope that you will be as well. Thank you.